Hello ladies and gentlemen, we are back in Imperator Rome, this time with the second part of my wonderful gameplay. Now, all of the footage shown in today's video is taken from a multiplayer game, if you can believe it. You can see some of the players on the right side of the screen there, in the outliner, and of course in this video I will not only be showing off gameplay footage, but also be addressing some of the wonderful questions you guys left on the last Imperator Rome video, because... Jesus Christ, there was an absolute ton, and I will have to work my way through them. So don't worry, if you left a question, I'm definitely going to address it. It's coming. Anyway, as you can see here in the background, we have almost kind of a question getting addressed. This is the trade situation in the game. Using trade routes, we can spend a few Moloch points to open up a trade route and to trade in a resource. Take livestock, for example, increased population growth. Now, this means that if you really, really, really want to actually grow a province, Instead of just like, you know, hitting the development button in EU4, it's actually a natural process. And in this case, the best way to do it is to um, just trade resources that encourage population growth. And it's a nice, natural, progressive thing, and it, it just feels more like a gameplay mechanic. Now, over to my right, you might see the kind of red nation with the blue flag. That's the Icenia. That's Enter Elysium. And to our north, we have the nation of the Brigantia. That is the wonderful conflict nerd, City Skylines YouTuber. What an absolute bloody lovely guy. But of course we weren't the only free people in the game. There was a lot more people about. There were people over in Phrygia, a few people around the whole uh, region of Egypt and also Italy, but most importantly the main power players, those around Denmark and southern Sweden. My god. So these are the pesky little tribes. Oh my good lord are they annoying. Mostly just because they are played by a few of the print media people who are lovely gentlemen to have drinks with and Johan. Now, whilst they are lovely and friendly people in the real world, for some reason they weren't happy with the fact that we were rapidly expanding all over the United Kingdom and kind of building a bit of a huge power base for ourselves. As you can see at the moment, we're kind of all working together in our wars. So I would call in Enter Elysium into a war and we'd split the land up and Brigantia as well. Well, mostly it was just trying to rescue Conflict Nerd from himself because yes, he was caught in quite a few horrific wars. <laughs> but yes, um, Enter Elysium is just calling me into a war, as we can see now. It's actually a ridiculously stable multiplayer experience, so I mean, if you're used to CK2 booting you out every five seconds, uh, we, we didn't really have any of that. I mean, I was quite surprised by the fact that this isn't even finished yet. <laughs> as we can see at the moment, um, yeah, Conflict Nerd, he's not in the best situation, especially because uh, it was his ally who called him into this war, and so neither of us can join into this war really and help him. However, myself and Enter Elysium are doing our part by simply declaring war on a few of the people he's at war with, mostly for our own game, but you know, why not help out? Everyone wants a friend. So yeah, and of course naturally I would like to take over all of the United Kingdom. Actually, there's one thing I'd like to quickly address, even though we haven't really gone onto the question and answer section. But um, many of you I know are worried about the whole um, kind of like diplomatic actions you can see me doing here. So, for example, supporting rebels, and you can like incite disloyalty from a provincial governor and get him to flip to your side. That kind of thing is incredibly unbalanced at the moment. Same with assassinating generals. The diplomatic actions aren't finished, don't worry. What you'll see in the war is that um, Johan uh, decides to exploit his own game and incite one of my... Um, actually, no, it wasn't even one of mine. He he incited one of Enter Elysium's entire regions to rebel against him, and they immediately start following Johan's government. It's, uh, it's a bit crazy. Equally, we just chain-murdered all of their kings, and some would say that's how this entire conflict started, due to the fact that we did... Um, murder in quick succession all of their powers and incite rebellions. But of course I'd like to still blame Johan for the fact that he tried to flip our countries against ourselves. And this kind of is not really going to be in the end result of the game, don't worry. You're not going to have bloody Phrygia from Africa starting to suddenly flip around your provinces and take control of it. Which is what they do in this game, it doesn't happen. It won't happen if this happens in the real game. Johan will have gone absolutely mad, so don't worry. We should be good. I've also seen a lot of concerns around kind of like the whole combat side of things. I find the combat very good, to be honest. I quite like it. I find it almost like a blend of EU4 and Hoi4. We find ourselves um, leading units as if it was EU4, but of 
uh, in kind of like the in-depth combat. I'd say it's hoi four, but with RNG, so you can kind of decide strategies, and it's much more. It, it tells you more information than Hoi4 does. So Hoi4 has a habit of hiding stuff behind tooltips and you'd have to go and search to actually see what each strategy is doing and only the real best players will even have an idea as to that. But it, this kind of simplifies it into more of a rock, paper, scissors, lizard, spock, paper, loads and loads of other, other stuff going on. And so the combat is slightly more advanced than just your standard rock, paper, scissors of um, just CK2 having more numbers. Uh, so yeah, I'm very happy with this. Also, there is army lock in the game. I saw concern for it, but as you can see, there is army lock in the game. So as soon as you can see that an AI is stuck moving towards a province, you can move to intercept them and grab them, which is, oh my god, absolutely lovely. Of course, though, um, those pesky horses, horses move faster than infantry, which means they're an absolute pain to track down. <laughs> they are a real bloody pain to track down. Oh my good lord. They just go so fast. If anything, to track down horses, you need more horses. That's really what I found out. But of course, this is just a game in development, so I'm sure quite a few of these things will be getting balanced. Now, I also uh, saw a question about why is Ireland uninhabited. Ireland isn't uninhabited. There are people there. There's population there. Kind of like how in the New World in um, EU4 there's development in the New World. There's people living on Ireland. They're just not living in unified nations. There's lots of little tribesmen. And you can colonize it quite easily, in fact, actually. Um, all you need to do is get 10 pops in a province bordering at the moment. By the way, this will probably be changed. And then you can simply move a pop across to colonize it. It was actually a really fun mechanic. I quite like it. It was a bit snowbally, but if anything, I actually preferred it because I found colonizing in EU4 it's really tiresome. It takes so much time and it has so little reward. And this game, it really felt like you know, it, it was a way of avoiding war and still growing a nation, and I enjoyed that. Also, um, I've seen quite a few confusions around kind of like. Is there a way to actually play tall in this game? And there is. There really is. Of course, I am of the kind of making sure you have the largest font size possible school of strategy. So I'm personally not one to usually stick around to develop a nation. But I have had moments when I play um, EU4 when I just want to see how high I can get my development. Or just in CK2, just see how much money I can make by just building up infrastructure. And this game has it in the form of population growth. There are buildings, and buildings can improve population growth, etc., etc. So there is ways to snowball up your country. The more pops you have, the more buildings you can have in a province. And the more buildings you have in a province, you can just add manpower, supply, etc., etc., etc. So if you really focus on just improving a set amount of your empire, you will reach a situation where you actually can. Oh, and actually, I think this is when we're starting to get close to war, because I've just bought a large amount of military power, and yes, we decide to support rebels in their countries. Yeah. <laughs> PDX Event 19, by the way, is Johan. TJ is one of the print media, um, who was an absolutely lovely sort, and yeah, the rest I... Oh God, I've zoomed in so I can't really tell yet, but the rest were print media. Absolutely lovely chappies. So yeah, we want to finish off this war, however, they did get an event saying that we caused this. Hmm. Yeah, it's not the best. It's given them a heads up on the situation and it means that they've started rapidly building boats. Now, I thought we were sat pretty happily because, I mean, I start out the game with like 10 boats and well, actually, no, I've got nine ships actually at the moment because I lost one partway through this multiplayer game. And Entrelysium's got 10 boats. Briganti, I think, have maybe uh, two. <laughs> um, so yeah, we actually have a pretty sizable navy and I have a decent admiral. But now here we get into the war. So. Phrygia over there has decided, oh no, it's Parthia has joined in. Phrygia thankfully didn't, but Parthia incited a rebellion in one of my generals and stole quite a large portion of my land. Now, of course, you can only do this in, you can keep generals loyal, and there is actually quite an, I could have actually kept him loyal. It was mostly the case that I wanted to see what would happen if he did actually flip. And I actually prefer, I, I love that there is a feature where you can have unloyal generals and they switch kind of like loyalty because of course it was one of those lovely features in Rome 1 that I hold to be very nostalgic and of course yes that was us just defeating one of their many armies 
Um, out of our three-player alliance, myself, E, and Conflict Node, I do have the largest army, so it is effectively up to me to defend my wonderful allies. Um, especially Conflict Node, considering his empire kind of got cut in half by the AI. Yeah, he lost quite a few wars. <laughs> But this section of land down here which we're sieging is the section of land which Johan decided to steal from Enter Elysium by inciting a rebellion. Yeah. But of course that just means we can get some ticking war score. <laughs> oh, goodness. Now who ends up winning the war? Well, as much as I don't like to give any spoilers, I'd just like to say I am probably the first human being in existence to beat the game developer himself at his own game. That's right ladies and gentlemen, we won the war. Well, kind of. Uh, we won the war mostly because we had to end the session so that everyone could head off and catch their trains etc. But yes, I did win. I'd just like to throw it out there. It was our team. We did great. It was absolutely a beautiful coordination. The uh, the enemy team, there was, there was attempts at coordinating but as you can see one of them would land an army and a boat and if they all managed to time the landings of their army and kind of pile it up all into one, we'd stand absolutely no chance. But it was the fact that they kind of just gently dropped uh, a nice even 6 or 8k at a time, it meant that well, my army could 1v1 it quite happily and walk away the victors. So yeah, it was a it was an interesting war, but really, really, I mean, it was it was down to our brilliant coordination there. Hats off to E and Conflict Node, of course, for being absolutely lovely people to play the game with. I must say, when it comes to a multiplayer experience in in Imperator Rome, this was exactly what I wanted. I wanted a game like this. It ran really smooth. It was like a fluid combat. There was fun stories to tell, and it was just a good game that you kind of like you're having it with your friends. And I know that even after this war, given the state of everything, we could have like easily fixed it. We could have sorted out a nice happy peace deal, and it wouldn't be the end of the game for anyone really, because it's like it's like EU4. Just because you lose a war, it doesn't mean the game's over. Certainly, I found with Heart in Hearts of Iron 4, it's just all about one single war. Meaning that, yeah, the game's over for you if you lose World War II. It's completely over. Ooh. Now, as you can see here, I, I, ha I want to try and assassinate the enemy general. But I decided against it because I don't even have enough military power. But as you can see, the war... Well, this battle here was a bit difficult, mostly because their general is very good and actually had a good strategy against me. You see, this... um. I can't remember who was playing them, but uh, there was a segment of the print media who really enjoyed the actual battles of the game. And so he deliberately chose a military strategy which was designed to counter the ones that we were using. I think mostly just using a, a defense kind of one. And uh, yeah, it was proved actually really effective. And if it hadn't been for the extra 5k from Enter Elysium to reinforce me, as you can see, I lost like thousands of men in that battle and it was actually really brutal but it's just the sheer amount of numbers from Enter Elysium which means that we had a nice and lovely easy victory there oh thank you very much Enter Elysium always coming to save the day on my behalf now of course their army's battered it's got low morale and so we can just hop our armies on in there and try and get a stack wipe I think that's the plan I should probably also actually answer a few of your questions because you guys left an absolute ton on the last video, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of questions. I mean, also loads of you like the video, so thank you very much. It really does help me out. And many of you subscribed off of the back end of it. And if you have, I strongly recommend you watch my Men of War of Sword Squad 2 video because it will guarantee a good laugh for you. But yes, of course, if you're also enjoying this video or you have another comment, leave it in the description. Please do give the video a like. It really does help out. And I'll try my best to answer your questions in the comment section. But alas, it's time to answer the questions on the last video. <clears throat> so, Legend of Total War, an absolutely lovely uh, Total War YouTuber, has said that um, he was absolutely sold on the game since it released. And he can't wait for it to come out. Did they give any indication of when it will be released? Well... As I responded to him, um, I really think it's a case of whenever Johan thinks the game is ready. Uh, my guess is they might try and want to re they might actually want to release it for a late Q1 release, but I imagine Johan is just going to do it whenever he feels he's ready with the game. And I think that means we we might not even see this game until Q2 or Q3 or perhaps even Q4. It's entirely possible that this game will release. Uh, coincide with the PDX con. Honestly, could. William Roberts asked a very important question for, of course, the Drew Dernal fans out there. Will this be a game that can be used in a mega campaign? Now, um, see, I'm not too certain, mostly due to the fact that the game runs from, uh, it, well, it runs up to 1 AD, if I remember correctly, 
or is it 1 BC? Something ridiculous like that. Um, of course, it's a bit complicated because the calendar is not done via the um, uh, BC AD calendar that we're used to. This is done using the uh, Roman calendar. And so, yes, it's a bit complicated, but I think that even though the timelines won't meet up with any existing Paradox game, due to the incredible modability of this game, I think you could easily see a modder or someone successfully making a way to convert this into CK2 and beyond. I think it's a real possibility. Um, another thing which I saw getting repeatedly asked was that if there will be kind of like a multiple start date system, kind of like start dates locked behind DLC, kind of like CK2, and the game devs have kind of basically said, no, there is one start date for this game, and that's the one that we started in. Are nations locked? No. You can play literally any nation in the game. What do I think about the DLC policy personally? I think that they're likely to go for a DLC system where they flesh out entire regions of the game. So I think we might see, say, uh, a DLC policy where they kind of really flesh out try, uh, playing as a tribe in the north. At the moment, you can play as a tribe in the north and you'll have an absolutely bloody unique experience. And it's great fun. However, I think they might want to take it even further because the issue is this is such a huge game. There's 9,000 provinces. There's loads and loads of stuff going on. It's very difficult to actually focus down on one select part. But I think they'll do a great job as long as they've released the game in a similar state to what it is and just polish it. If you do that, I think it's well worth, I don't know, whatever, 40 quid, 60 quid, however much they're going to charge for it, because you'll get several hundred hours out of it. And as long as Johan and his team also continue the kind of trend of having a paid update, which adds flavor, but also a free update alongside it, which fixes the game, adds more to the game, and keeps it being a new experience rather than just continually releasing, I don't know, a new Rome Imperator every two years. So I'm very glad that these are kind of almost projects of love rather than just either a spam of crappy DLC or just a sequel after sequel after sequel. Also, for those of you that wanted the exact time span of the game, the game goes from 450 AUC to 755 AUC, which is a ridiculously long time span for a game. Of course, I think it's slightly under the time span of EU4, but maybe a one tag's possible, maybe a full world conquest. Who, uh, who knows? It could honestly be anything. Now, in comparison to real world time, that is 304 BC, to uh, 1 CE, so quite a long time span. I saw a lot of questions regarding if I could give any more details on the modding of the game, and other than what Paradox has already released, saying that this is going to be probably their most moddable game, um, I can't really give any details. I got a few hands-on experiences with the modding tools, but they're kind of like work in progress, and it's unknown what you guys might get a hold of, so I honestly can't say, but from what I did see, I was very happy with. And if you're a modder and you're only interested in this game for modding, then perhaps, I don't know, maybe sit back, relax, see what happens closer to the date, because I definitely know there's a large segment of the team working on some pretty exciting modding tools, so see what they're like, and then make your judgment on the game. Another person also asked about custom nations, like in Europe Universalis 4, and as far as I'm aware, in the base game, nope, that does not exist. I mean, I don't really imagine that it's a historical game, so it wouldn't really make sense to add custom nations into the base game. You might see like a small DLC, something like the uh, CK2 ruler desi uh, designer, that kind of thing getting added into the game, but honestly, I mean, considering how easy it was to mod the game from my experience, I think if you wanted a custom nation, you could just do it yourself. <laughs> it's it's not too difficult at all, but maybe there'll be a DLC. It's absolutely nothing announced yet though, so I can't really help you. Uh, someone called the Earl of Doncaster, of course, asking, why is Germania greyed out? Pretty sure the Romans went there. You're indeed correct. So, the greyed out areas of the map, you might be looking at them and you're like, Jesus Christ, this is terrible. Like, there could be nations there. There's people living there. Why aren't there nations there? Well. Allow me to tell you why. These are technically uncolonized bits of land, so there's no like ruling tribe over them. And if the Romans wanted to go there, then they can. All they need is, of course, 10 men on the border and then just slowly start marching all the way through Germany and you can colonize the entire thing. Naturally, there'll be issues with culture and trying to get the tribesmen to actually like not being tribesmen anymore, maybe civilize them a bit more. But yes, it is in the game and it doesn't mean that these grayed out bits of land won't see any action. If Roma isn't the one to colonize it, you best be careful because there might be a few German tribes that would like to expand in that direction. 
Uh, Hoz asking, is there anything happening in East Asia? Um, what's the extent of the map and does it change over the ages? E.g. can you colonize land with better technologies? So as I mentioned previously, the colonization, uh, colonization can happen anytime. You don't need any technologies. Uh, does it change over the ages? Well, I think it would only change based on if the AI had something coded in it to make it want to colonize or if the players themselves went out and colonized the land. Um, and what is the extent of the map? So it basically goes from uh, the edge of Europe and Portugal all the way over to um, the edge of India. Someone asked uh, when I was talking about modding, it sounds like there's an actual modding interface in the game. Is this correct or is it just a misunderstanding on your part? Um, so from my experience, there was a modding interface in the game, but of course it's not finished, it's for developers, and whether there will be a modding interface in the game or not is entirely up to them. I can't say, but from my experience and the thing I was using, yes, there was a bit of an interface. Someone asking, is there an America and Asia in this game? So there's a part of Asia, but there is no America in this game as far as I know. If they were to add America into this game, you'd be looking at probably the largest grand strategy ever made. Like it, It's like strapping the development of EU4, CK2 and Imperator Rome together. Because Imperator Rome, for the size of the map we have, it's ridiculously detailed. And to scale it up to include the Americas would be almost impossible. I have no idea how they could do it, but... You never know. Maybe the technology will be there in the future and a game engine powerful enough to even render that. Uh, someone asking, do I think the Roman Empire will be the first DLC considering the game ends before Caesar's Ascension? So, um, no, I don't think that's going to be a DLC. As I, of course, mentioned earlier, I don't think we'll be seeing DLC revolving around actual changing of the start dates. For example, adding in a DLC where you get to play at Caesar's Ascension. I don't really think that's going to be the case. It doesn't really seem to be something Paradox wants to um, go into, so I don't think we'll be seeing DLC like that. Another question that was widely asked was that if there are formable nations in the game, and there are, they you can access them through the decisions tree, and if you watch Quill 18's video, I'm pretty sure he shows off um, him forming the equivalent of Belgium, and also if you go onto my Twitter, you can see me tweeting out and releasing when he formed um, Pickland, which is kind of like the formed version of England, and these are really fun things to do. Um, I can't really go into too many details about them, but the decision tree thing is there. We just won't really allow to show off because graphically it's not really ready. But yes, congratulations. There are formable tribes, there are formable nations, there are formable states. It's quite an exciting little thing. Uh, someone called False Warp asked, of course, um, is Alexander in this game? He is not. He dies kind of just before this game happens. So we're kind of seeing the collapse of the... Alexander and his amazing things, but you can see the wonderful friends that he had. For example, the uh, leader of Egypt, he is one of Alexander's best friends. And there's of course also Macedon. It's great to see the interactions between those countries because of the history. Napoleon Bonaparte also asked, when can this game be pre-ordered? Um, I'd just like to say that whilst you might like to pre-order games, I would always strongly recommend never ever ever pre-order a game. I'd honestly even be skeptical about buying a game on day one. I personally like to generally wait about a week uh, since the release of a game so that the hype has kind of died down and people's first kind of like enthusiasm and excitement about the game has slowly kind of trickled away and then you start seeing kind of like the real opinions about the game starting to surface. So I'd strongly recommend waiting for that and then and then getting the game. But of course you do you. I can't be the judge of that. Someone of course asked, uh, can you rename your army? You can, in fact I'm pretty sure I might have done it in the first video, maybe one of them, I don't know. But yeah, I've renamed my armies, it was good fun. In fact, it was really good fun, because you, the armies you rename, they kind of, they, they stay that way for a while. Whilst the generals of an army might grow old and die, your army's actually going on to actually be a historical thing, and the, the units in your army, they're gaining more experience, they're going on, their loyalty keeps changing, it's a very exciting thing. Someone asking that even though they know the game isn't finished yet, how was the aggressiveness between the AI and each other? I would say the aggressiveness existed, it wasn't particularly crazy. I would say it's um, it's it's somewhere between CK2 and EU4, so if CK2 was having not too many wars and EU4 was having slightly too many, it's a, a nice little midpoint between the two. There's enough wars to keep the game exciting, but not too many that it starts becoming a bit wild and crazy. <laughs> And of course also I received probably about 50 comments of people asking about when Vicky Free is getting released. And even though I sat down and asked Johans oh so many times for Victoria Free, all he said was, well you gamers have got mobile phones. 
<laughs> okay, no, to clarify, he did not say that. I have no idea when Vicky Free is coming. I don't even know if there will be a Vicky Free, but by God, I, I pray it's not a mobile game, and I'm sure it won't be. <laughs> Uh, Someone asked if Greek Hoplites are in this game and if they have kind of like a difference over other units. And they exist, um, but not in the form of you build a separate unit for them. So the Greek Hoplite thing is kind of that instead you just pick a strategy. And that's the Greek Hoplite. It makes it much better because it means, of course, if you don't want to actually use Greek Hoplite strategies, then it works. And it means that... If you're not continuously going up against Greek armies that are always using it because if you are then you always know the perfect counter against it is to go for a really I don't know flank heavy army so if the Greek hoplites are going into war they might deliberately refuse to not use the spears for one day of the week who knows Bradley asked a very important question which is that if armies can be wiped out kind of like a stack wipe similar to EU4 and yes they can thank god they can because otherwise you're having to chase down tiny little stacks of men that are just sieging your provinces and they won't ever go away but yes armies can be stack wiped someone also asked if Ulm is still OP and yes of course it is is there no evil combat yes there is don't worry do I think a world conquest is possible I think it's a possibility but they said it was impossible to do world conquest in EU4 and uh, yeah someone went and did it so I think we will probably see a world conquest in Imperator at some point um, someone said what tea do you guys have English breakfast of course all the way that's what you guys should be drinking right now um, someone said this re reminds them of a grand strategy war band I guess it kind of is um, but of course without the close combat battles that you can have in Mountain Blade Warband. And yeah, that kind of just about wraps up all the questions that I didn't kind of answer in the comment section, or ones that I did answer but felt that all of you guys should probably hear. So hey, if you've enjoyed the video, please do give it a like. It's not my standard kind of content. Um, I usually do more comedy videos, but hey, you know, it always helps to do a Q&A every now and again. If you have enjoyed it, then please do tell me, and if you want more Imperator, then do say so, and I might consider making some more, although you will definitely get some as soon as the game is released. Anyway, I've been the Spiffing Brit and I will see all of you in the next one.